can um can you hear me? We're all on mute, but yes, we can. Yeah, great. I want to make sure about. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. So, I'm Nancy Byatt. I'm the um medical director of MCPAP for Moms, which in case you don't know the acronym is the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program for Moms. And we're today to do this webinar, Screening, Assessing, Managing, and Managing Parallel Substance Use Disorders. And we are particularly excited about this topic because this is something that our program has had funding in, in the last year to be able to expand our services to address perinatal um, substance use disorders. And so this is sort of our kickoff event of having this webinar to be able to, um, in, for that expansion. A couple of housekeeping things before I introduce Dr. Mittal, our speaker, that the session will be recorded and available on our website at www.mcpatformoms.org. Any of the PowerPoint slides will also be available on the McPat for Moms website under Toolkit and Resources and then under PowerPoint Presentations. And our presenters will stop for several for questions during the presentation, and there'll also be time at the end. And if you have a question or comment, please type it into the question box during the presentation, and we will read out your question line to enable you to ask your question. And after this presentation, you're going to receive a brief survey following it, and really appreciate your feedback because this really helps us improve for future presentations. Just to introduce Lena Mattal. Lena is the Associate Medical Director of MCPAP for Moms and has really been is an expert in perinatal substance use disorders and has been leading our substance use expansion over the past year or so. And she has clinical interest and academic interest in perinatal substance use disorders. She provides care for these patients and also does a lot of co-located care working in OB settings. And we're so Lena, you can go ahead and start, and then I will come back in at the end when it's time for questions. Nancy, and thank you all for attending. I'm particularly excited to, to start to really uh, move forward this great initiative that um, we've been kind of planning for for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm hoping to sort of go through a, a few points about sex and gender differences in um, substance use disorder as well as sort of what makes pregnancy a particular as one of the sex differences um, so important. Talk a little bit about MCPAP for Moms itself and our goal for <clears throat> being able to help providers on the front lines really seeing these women in the course of prenatal care and um, SUD care. Um, help. Our goal is to help um, increase your capacity and to really be a resource for, for being the care of these women. And also talk a little bit more in depth about some of the specific substances of abuse and some of the unique aspects of their manage of the management of those use disorders. So the the main uh, sort of point about um, sort of and gender differences that are important in women um, as compared to men is that what well, all the data that's really looked at gender specific treatment suggests that women can benefit from treatment that specifically addresses women's needs. And women-only treatment is one version of that, so having single-sex treatment, and that has been associated with lower rates of relapse and um, improved outcomes in some studies. But there's such a few number of studies because these programs are so heterogeneous, it's difficult to study them in a broad way. But there are also other versions of sort of women-specific or gender-specific treatment that can include things like integrated child care, integrated prenatal care, um, in an HIV care, but in a mixed gender uh, trend setting. Um, and, and all these programs appear to, when, when um, studied, have really shown that they can help with things like retention and treatment and time to relapse. Sorry, I think it's really helpful to kind of enter a discussion like this in a case. And so I use this case um, of a patient that I saw um, earlier in my career um, who was a 32-year-old woman who presented to labor and delivery in our hospital. She came in with abdominal pain um, and said she was around seven months pregnant but didn't really know how far along she was. She had gotten very little prenatal care. Uh, what, we, what we were able to glean from, from a record review was that she had one prenatal visit at a, an affiliated community health center um, with a midwife who, in her notes, noted that the patient smelled of alcohol. Um, and the patient, she would come back in, but then didn't return to treatment. 
And when um, the midwife had attempted to reach out to her and try to re-engage her into prenatal care, um, she found the patient to have slurred speech, and, and she was quite worried about her, but really the patient had never been able to, to represent. Um, when we were evaluating her on labor and delivery, what we noticed or what we came to find out was that she had been struggling with an alcohol use disorder. She had been drinking daily um, and had been in the midst of an IPV um, affected relationship with the father of her pregnancy and had fled uh, the relationship and was hiding in, uh, in, in an apartment somewhere of a friend and it was a very unstable housing situation. She had lost custody of a prior child, a child she had delivered previously, had poor access to food, um, and was really spending most of her time drinking um, and not feeling able to engage in her prenatal care. And she described a fair amount of shame about this, saying that I just can't get it together. I had planned to get it together to, before I came in and I kept telling myself I would stop drinking so I could come back in to prenatal care, and I never could. Um, and so this, op this is sort of an opportunity um, to really engage with her and hopefully try to engage her in treatment, both for her prenatal care and her um, substance use disorder. Then when thinking about what kind of treatment to offer her, it's sort of it, throughout perinatal mental health treatment of any sort, whether that's for a psychiatric condition like a mood or anxiety disorder or for a substance use disorder, it's always kind of important to balance that when we're thinking about aging and treatment, we're thinking about the risk of the untreated symptoms, in this case, allowing substance use alongside the risks of treatment, which may or may not include medications, depending on um, what we're talking about. And which substance we're talking about. So I think it's a pretty easy case to make that substance use itself, the illness, the untreated illness that we're discussing at this point, is associated with significant risks to a pregnancy, um, to and to the woman herself and her health during pregnancy and ongoing, the fetus and the family after delivery. Um, to kind of bear that out a little bit, you know, substance Substances, some of our, the substances of abuse are teratogenic. Um, often in having a substance use disorder is um, associated with poor nutrition and limited access to prenatal care and other health-related behaviors. From um, an obstetric standpoint, um, substance use disorders can be associated with placental issues or difficulties with labor management. Um, for a woman, withdrawal issues can complicate management of many things depending on um, what substance the person is drawing from, and it can carry significant risks um, to health and, and also can increase risk for death um, in the case of some substances. Um, and then certainly overdose is the most catastrophic risk, but a risk that's really important that we think about and address in the course of treatment of substance use disorders. And then also if there's um, interest of, of substances, then infectious risk is something that we're often thinking about. And we think of this as really a preventable cause of maternal and infant mortality, and this is a place in which um, women are motivated to engage in treatment, and so it's really an opportunity um, in size when you have a woman who's presenting with co-occurring substance use disorder in pregnancy. And, and this notion of pregnancy being a window of opportunity is really borne out in epidemiologic data. So these data are from um, a relatively older version of the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, which assess that past, if when it's a census-style survey of women, um, reproductive age, age 15 to 44, who um, the surveyors asked among many questions, um, how much, uh, have you used this particular substance and this variety of substances in the past month? For who are not pregnant, the rates of the drug use were, you know, paralleling the rates in the general population. Um, but for pregnant women, women who are currently pregnant, the use in the past month was significantly decreased. And it's important to notice here is that while um, there's varying levels of decrease, so the alcohol, the, the diminution or the decrease of use of some substances like alcohol is slightly different than the use of cigarettes. That sort of parallels probably what we're seeing in our clinical populations, where some substances are deemed more risky, and so people understand that they, the goal is to decrease use, whereas others are harder to stop or, um, or the public health message is not as clear. Um, there are two important factors here, and one is that, that 
substance still occurs in pregnancy, but pregnancy is a time where there is a motivation for change. Um, and I think the other piece of this that I always think about is that the women who continue to use during pregnancy are likely to have a more severe phenotype of a substance use disorder. And so these women are in the midst of a more severe illness that really requires um, more intervention and as much resource as we can um, present to them. But working with women with substance use during pregnancy, really, while it is a time of opportunity, really does present a number of challenges. And again, this, some of this is, is sort of intuitive. These, these are really difficult patients to treat because we sometimes uh, are fa they are facing a significant amount of stigma and shame as the in the case that I described at the beginning. Um, sometimes lead to a, a late presentation to prenatal care, and so then that sort of shrunken window of time to intervene really limits our ability to, to help patients. Um, also, it's a refractory illness. It's hard to treat, especially if they're continuing to use in pregnancy. Providers have a lot of concerns about um, what are the legal obligations? How do I engage appropriately and fairly with um, legal systems? How do I find the right kind of treatment, accessing treatment that's going to appropriate address the unique issues of a pregnant woman can be challenging. And then also managing our own emotional reactions, our feelings about patients who may be using substances during pregnancy. They have a number of other um, social complexity, uh, factors like social complexity that go along with ongoing substance use. Uh, what's also important to know is that women with substance use disorders can present in a variety of ways during pregnancy and the postpartum period. That the case of um, that I presented earlier can be a late presentation to prenatal care or evidence of acute intoxication, like she had. She smells of alcohol. She sounded like she was slurring her words when the midwife called her. Um, sometimes it can be a positive toxicologic um, uh, test. So whether it's urine or meconium in um, the mother or the baby um, during pregnancy or postpartum. Sometimes it's a, a screening test. A, a an insured questionnaire around um, substance use where someone may disclose the thing substances. Sometimes an antepartum testing with growth restriction or other fetal findings that might raise a suspicion for um, uh, prenatal substance use. And, you know, and an unfortunate outcome is to have withdrawal in the neonate and not be the first indication that there may have been maternal substance use. Um, that's really represents a missed opportunity. When there's a concern or suspicion that a patient might be struggling with a substance use disorder in pregnancy, McPath firms, our goal is really to be a, a resource to help uh, providers, with, and especially across all uh, mental health um, concerns, but substance use disorder being really included as one of them. We operate with, a, with three elements. We have an educational component. We have a consultation component where we have an 855 line that providers can call us and, and engage in real-time phone consultation, which can also evolve into a face-to-face -face consultation if the phone call is not enough. And we also have resource and referral services that we're able to use our resource and referral specialist to um, do some amount of engaging um, of patients either directly by having patient contact or um, also sending providers resources to, to pass along to their patients. Who can call McPat for Moms? Really, any prescribing provider. It's really important to us that um, that be clear that any provider of any type is welcome to call us. We, the majority of our calls come from obstetric providers and midwives, but we get a lot of calls from psychiatric providers. And we're, our goal is really now to expand our reach to helping SU, substance use disorder care providers also feel comfortable calling us and asking us questions about perinatal substance use disorder or co-occurring mental health conditions that they may be seeing in patients that they're already um, working with. Um, our program works is, is relatively straightforward. Uh, providers can call an 855 line, which is 855-MOM-MCPAP or 666-6272. Um, and they can, will, upon calling, will reach one of our resource and referral specialists who will get a little bit of uh, clinical information, um, get a little bit of a uh, sense of what is the nature of the call, and then pass it on to our um, psychiatrist providers if, um, 
if there's a clinical question that could benefit from a consultation. During the course of that phone consultation, we can then um, whether it may be necessary to, to bring the patient in. This is, you know, not always necessary after a, a phone consultation, but if needed, it's an option. They can come into one of our three hubs, um, or we can reach out to the patient and, and pass along resources directly to the patient. One outcome that can also happen even without the provider-to-provider -provider phone consultation is that a, a calling provider can request resources be sent directly to their office um, by phone, by email, or by fax, or by email um, to the pass on to the patient directly. So any of those potential outcomes can come from calling our phone um, Our website has a, a wealth of resources about um, perinatal mental health disorders, and we have a toolkit that addresses depression and its management, as well as other emotional concerns that can come up during pregnancy that's targeted towards um, care providers. We have um, a discharge toolkit that are specific to perinatal substance use disorder, which we're in the process of finalizing and will be forthcoming. Um, and we will be distributing to all of you as attendees of this, of this uh, webinar and will be on our website as well. Um, and our website also has resources for um, others and families to, to access. And so another thing that you can direct patients direct to, to, to be able to look at some of the educational resources themselves that are sort of patient facing, as well as um, a support group finder um, that can be sometimes quite useful. Um, so when you're thinking about uh, engaging with a woman who, um, or when, really at any point in care, the most important thing is to really um, think about substance use as part of the screening and assessment that can occur throughout pregnancy and postpartum care. So it includes gathering a history, conducting the physical exam you would normally conduct, and look for um, you know, potential stigmata of substance use, addressing the prescription monitoring program, which in Massachusetts is called MassPAT, um, M-A-S-S-P-A-T, uh, that all licensed providers have access to. Um, and in some cases, the some of the electronic health records have direct links to, which, which can make it really convenient to look for prescriptions in the past year of controlled substances. Um, and then also carrying the utility and role for toxicologic testing, which is necessarily part of a universal screening and assessment, but really is to be used in a sort of judicious and targeted way um, rather than um, universally. And for this is that toxicologic screens, while um, can, they, can, they have incredible utility in some settings, they also have significant limits. And it's just important to kind of recognize that all of those prior components that we just discussed are part of investment for substance use. Um, when you're thinking about using a toxicologic screen, it's important to think about whether it'll be maternal, um, testing that um, happens at, during the course of prenatal care, or if it's maternal testing at the time of delivery, what um, is the, the possibility of gathering neonatal testing after delivery, whether that would be with urine or meconium. Uh, it's important to think about what will you use the outcome of that testing for? Is that something that's going to go into a potential report um, for child protection purposes? Is this something that's going to help assess uh, potential confounders to a clinical presentation? And it's important to know the limits of the, um, the taxable testing in your institution. Each, um, each institution can, can sort of purchase different products, and it's important to work with the lab to know what's the timeline for um, how long can a particular substance remain in, in a urine sample, how, um, what, are the, what is it testing for? Is it testing for metabolites? Is it testing for therapeutic levels versus levels that are more consistent binge pattern use? So there are unique characteristics of, of these tests, and they can vary from institution to institution. So it's important to know what are the limits and the reach of the testing that your institution is using. However, it is recommended by many uh, professional organizations, ACOG, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control, the AMA, are all consistent in recommending that during pregnancy screening take place. What's, what is meant by that, though, is not that it's toxicologic testing, but really using some kind of um, verbal or paper and pencil screening that will help engage a woman in a conversation about the level of use and the current use. 
recommend a modified version of what's called the TAPS tool, which is a shortened version of the NIDA Quick Screen. Um, it is a very useful um, tool to assess for to be able to risk stratify patients, but it's not a usual screening tool where you, you kind of quantify a degree of symptoms and get a score at the end and then use that score to guide treatment. It's really more of a conversation starter. Um, and, and more about this will be available in our toolkit as that comes out. But really the way um, the TAPS tool works is um, to ask in the past year, how often have you used one of these um, types of substances and at what frequency? And if, if any or other than never occurs, this is considered a positive screen and should prompt follow questions to, to qualitatively characterize which substances how much over what period of time, meaning is this happening currently, is this happening in the past, is the thing that um, needs for assessment. Oh, excuse me. And so that happens. Once somebody is, the, the amount of use is assessed, then a patient can stratified amongst these various risk categories, and then those risk categories can then help um, what degree of um, what type of follow-up needs to happen. So for someone who's in the very low risk category, for example, not currently using anything, or they may have used substances in the past that stopped for the purposes of pregnancy, it's uh, simply educational intervention saying, reversing that behavior, recommending continuing to avoid substances, and then encouraging the patient to ask for help if that comes up is a way to kind of open the door to maintain this as a topic of conversation that you're interested in, um, but doesn't necessarily pathologize prior use or stigmatize somebody for disclosing anything. Um, moderate risk may be a history of high use, but relatively currently stable um, with low levels use at any point in pregnancy, potentially these are sort of examples of a way moderate use might present. At that point, really, it's a, a matter of making a plan with the patient to continue to monitor together to repeat the screen at regular intervals at least once per trimester and in the postpartum period. Um, whereas for high-risk patients may, who may be having current or active use, the goal would be then to engage in a brief intervention of sorts and to think about um, assess readiness for change and um, their interest in referral to services, which is another place through which PAP for Moms can be helpful. Mostly, any woman with a history of substance use should be counseled as soon as possible about the possibility of social services, i.e., um, DCF, being involved in the care. Um, it's, it's unfortunate um, that right now the state of things is that there's a fair amount of inconsistency about how that report can get made. And there are a number of uh, mandated reporters um, that can be involved in a patient's care along the way. And so it's important to think about. Um, to think about um, what what may not be able to be within the patient or your own control. And so it's important that women be prepared for the fact that this may be something that can come up during the course of their care. And this is an opportunity to then talk about what resources that are needed that can help improve the way that outcome could happen. Uh, that involves what is currently being called in our state and across many states a plan of safe care. So any pregnant or parenting woman with a history of substance users can benefit from thinking of enhancement of a team of providers. First, starting the conversation about who's in your treatment team, and then second, what is missing from that treatment team and how can we help you build team further or to make it more effective for you. Um, and this can then be helpful because if a report to DCF is made, DCF will ask, is there a plan of safe care in, um, in existence? And the person making the report can say yes or no. And um, the contents of that plan belong to the woman. They can be um, private and confidential, but that, that the plan exists can help DCF know to what degree this woman is engaged in care. Um, so for more information about the plan of safe care, there's a, a link here um, that how through the um, Institute for Health and Recovery, they have a sample template for a plan of safe care, if that might be something you want to use for a patient um, or import into your electronic medical record. Transition a little bit to talking about opioids at this point specifically, um, and 
I think the most important thing to be clear about is that while opioids themselves are not necessarily teratogenic, they're not necessarily associated with structural abnormalities or um, birth defects, the opioid use disorder can carry significant risk. And that's likely related to the fluctuations in level associated with uh, use and abuse and also um, the kind of lifestyle things that go along with it, the poor nutrition, the lack of um, prenatal care and that kind of thing. But opioid use disorder, or many studies that looked at this previously would define this as opioid dependence using older nomenclature, um, can be associated with injury and fetal demise and stillbirth, intrauterine growth restriction, placental abruption, preterm labor, postpartum hemorrhage. There's some uh, data that, that has associated opioid use with um, reduced cognitive function and exposed children. This is really poorly controlled because um, again, it's very difficult to control for confounders like poor nutrient and use of other substances that have more of an impact. Regular use in, uh, during pregnancy have increased throughout the United States and are increasing especially in Massachusetts. New England has been noted to be a um, state with increasing prevalence at a fast rate than um, the, the average throughout, um, throughout the U.S. And the, um, the important thing to note is that um, along with this comes a fair amount of increase in risk for uh, in the postpartum period, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And that can include risk to the mother and risk for overdose, as well as the risk for the neonate, um, which we'll talk more about as we go forward. Oh, there we go. Order in pregnancy is primarily treated um, pharmacologically, meaning that one of the, the mainstays of treatment are pharmacologic treatments, and that includes uh, first line, rather, methadone and buprenorphine, where um, though it's important to know that naltrexone, which is available, available both uh, orally and through intramuscular uh, monthly injection, it has some emerging evidence that, um, that bringing it to the forefront of people's minds, especially for women who've had good experience with it. So we'll talk a little bit about how to think about incorporating that amongst the more, um, the better studied first line. And the reason for um, this focus on pharmacologic treatment is that with opioids especially, it's been really shown that because of the efficacy of these um, pharmacologic treatments, there's a really significant high risk of relapse after discontinuation of opioids with maintaining on an agonist treatment like methadone or buprenorphine. Uh, so, all this is to say that while maintenance treatment is preferred or ongoing treatment with an agonist like methadone or a partial agonist like buprenorphine, um, medication-assisted withdrawal or what's colloquially known as detox um, can be considered. And there is increasing literature suggesting that while, you know, five, ten years ago there was this belief that we absolutely would never um, support the withdrawal of opioids or or exposing a pregnancy to the risks of paternal opioid withdrawal, um, that increasingly the literature is, is supporting that in, when done very gradually with minimal symptomatology and not using very rapid detox protocols, there are limited differences, there are really no differences in, in obstetric outcomes in a couple of smaller studies um, showing that uh, there be something to Consider, especially if there is, if it's, if a patient is unable to find an MAT provider in particularly under-resourced areas, or is, has difficulty accessing because of her psychosocial circumstance, or she has a really strong preference towards um, having an assisted withdrawal rather than remaining on an agonist treatment. Um, so these circumstances might lend you to think about a potential gradual taper, um, either with or without the use of medication. Um, other than the substance being used um, for, for, for a patient who might have these, these characteristics. However, it's really important when you're thinking about counseling the patient that out an ongoing agonist treatment, the relapse risk is higher than um, for someone who is on treatment. Um, and that may be a risk that somebody feels very strongly that if they can optimize other relapse prevention strategies, they might be willing to take. Part about whether to engage in treatment includes thinking about um, what are the 
the benefits of those treatments. There are significant benefits demonstrated for treatment of, with treatment, pharmacologic treatment of opioid disorder, opioid use disorder. Maternal benefits include significant reduction in overdose-related deaths, including um, during the end in the postpartum period, decreased risk for um, in transmission and increased engagement in prenatal care and recovery treatment, which can include, which by, by extraction includes long time to relapse and um, retention of custody and uh, retention in treatment. Um, the benefits include reduction in fluctuations of maternal opioid levels, which is thought to decrease fetal stress, um, decrease intrauterine fetal demise risk, decrease in intrauterine growth restriction have both been demonstrated with um, engagement in pharmacologic treatment and also decrease in rates of preterm delivery. Um, pregnant women are entitled to priority access to methadone treatment, but it must be administered in a federally licensed facility. And it can be challenging. We have um, a, a relatively greater amount of resource in the Boston area. There's a number of um, methadone clinics, um, and but it can still be challenging to have a patient find a clinic that they are able to get a spot in, also able to access. Um, and uh, feel comfortable attending. So that can be really challenging, but especially in areas where there aren't very many clinics, clinics can still be challenging to find providers. And also, methadone clinics are um, a wonderful resource for, the, for a patient who can benefit from the structure of methadone treatment, but it requires daily present, presenting daily for direct observed treatment, um, which means standing in line, which means going presenting very, very early in the day, Patients that come to methadone clinics may be in varying states of recovery. Different clinics have different um, standards and rules of, and policies around use other substances, which can also be really challenging. If a woman has other children, they may not be comfortable bringing a child or children to a methadone clinic setting. Um, some clinics are really family oriented and have um, plenty of resources that can help facilitate that, but not all clinics have those resources. Um, so, methadone clinics can be particularly challenging, and also um, for a woman who's in who's pregnant, uh, it can also be, be can feel sort of marginalized in the setting of a methadone clinic. One of the benefits of methadone treatment are that it's a highly structured treatment that often comes with psychosocial treatments, including groups, individual counseling, as well as other um, community services and connection to other resources. So those things to think about for somebody who may benefit from a very highly structured treatment, but it does its downsides. Itself is a, is a, is physiologically and pharmacologically something that providers should know about. So this is well, we dose relatively lower for the beginning of a taper or for treatment with pain. Doses for um, the treatment of opioid use disorder can be relatively high, as high as 80 to 120 milligrams. And in the context of the, of the physiologic changes associated with the advancement of pregnancy, there may be a need to increase the dose as time goes on um, because of the more rapid metabolism. Also, that can lead to a need for a split dose or a twice a day dose rather than a single daily dose. And then that can raise some practical considerations because most methadone programs, because of directly observed therapy, have a one dosing time. So that can be challenging for some women who um, may or may not be able to access split dosing. You know, when I first got into this work some years ago, it was sort of considered an emerging treatment, but now is really solidly in this first line. Um, alongside methadone for treatment of opioid use disorder in pregnancy. Um, norepine has a lot of advantages. It has few drug-drug interactions, a lower opioid uh, overdose risk because it's a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor, which makes the risk of respiratory depression and intoxication or psychoactive symptoms much lower, so really diminishing the overdose risk. Um, and, and also the risk of sedation that can happen with, as methadone dose can increase, People can become acclimated to that dose, but still experience some sedation. Whereas buprenorphine, you really don't see that very often, especially when it's not um, being used in conjunction with other sedating medications, potentially sedating medications like benzodiazepines or um, or other things. Buprenorphine is offered in a different way than methadone. It's an office-based medication, meaning a patient gets 
goes to a provider who has an FDA waiver or DEA waiver rather to prescribe norepinephrine, which requires a provider who has gone through a, a, a an amount of training, a waiver course that's about eight hours of training and gets certified. Um, and then the patient receives a prescription and can go to a pharmacy and then go home and take the medication under their own control. It doesn't have to be administered by somebody else. So buprenorphine can be offered in two different ways, either in combination with naloxone, the trade name for that would be suboxone, or single formulation with buprenorphine alone, which would be subutex. The goal is generally to to have the fewest number of exposures during pregnancy possible. So when possible, single formulation buprenorphine is the preferred um, route to go. However, what we're seeing in Massachusetts, and in fact, um, this has kind of shifted the practice around this, is that so pharmacies don't necessarily have buprenorphine and single formulation as readily available. The manufacturer of it has been decreased, and so there's less supply overall in the market. It does also have a higher street value, and so there's some risk for diversion, and so all of that um, challenge of being able to find enough has can be a significant burden for a patient who's not sure whether she'll be able to fill her prescription in the same way she did last week or last month, or will the pharmacy have enough? Will she have to go back and forth, pay multiple copays, negotiate um, partial fill, those kinds of things, and so it's when those kinds of stressors can really put a woman's uh, sobriety and recovery at, at risk, it has increasingly become the practice to shift towards providing the combination formulation really to ensure um, recovery and decreasing the amount of stigma and stress that comes with filling the prescription. Um, and, and this is very reasonable because, in fact, in the combination formulation, the naloxone that's present is really not absorbed when the patient is taken sublingually. And the is not um, take, uh, absorbed sublingually and is not orally bioavailable. And so it's really very minimal exposure with really s relatively small risk. It is as effective as methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder on a number of criteria, including maternal weight gain, rates of cesarean, abnormal presentation. There's really no significant difference between uh, buprenorphine um, and methadone. And it's especially important important to know that it's as effective at decreasing um, substance use and sensitive, um, uh, urine screens. Um, Treprenorphine has three phases. So in, in the in general, we use the term induction for buprenorphine. I know in the obstetric world that has an entirely different meaning. Um, but when someone ha initiates the treatment of buprenorphine, it does require somebody being in mild withdrawal, um, depending on the gestational age for that pregnancy. And and the um, and other obstetric uh, factors, it may be worth considering: is there a rule for fetal monitoring or not? Does can this take place in an inpatient or outpatient setting? And that has everything to do with the obstetric situation, not necessarily anything to do with the substance disorder itself. And so those things can be decided on a case by case basis. Um, in terms of maintenance, it's really quite straightforward. There is, as with methadone, there may be some dose adjustment necessary as pregnancy advances. Um, because it's a high affinity partial agonist, it may have some implications for pain management. And so it's important to begin planning for pain management and delivery and um, in the part and period. So we recommend engaging NICU or newborn medicine, neonatology or special care nursery, whatever the setup is in your institution, early on to talk with this um, would be about, um, about what may happen for their neonate postpartum, but also to have an anesthesia consultation to talk about uh, regional analgesics and spinal versus epidural versus other options. Um, around the time of delivery in the postpartum period, it's important to, um, to advocate for patients to continue their maintenance dose. And that's not going to treat pain, but really needs to be continued to facilitate ongoing treatment in the postpartum period. Pain be managed based on a prior pain management plan if it's been able to be um, developed, and then and that knowing that women with opioid use disorder may have higher tolerance to pain medication, lower thresholds for, for treatment of pain, um, and so it's really important to assure patients that their pain can be uh, managed and will be in a, a non-stigmatizing way. 
Um, once someone has delivered, it is reasonable to switch for, if, if the person has been on single formulation, to switch to the combination formulation. It will um, be very reasonable to consider, to make choices in consideration of breeding and lactation, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and then to be aware that the dopaminergin will then need to be adjusted over the two to four weeks postpartum after, if a dose changes have occurred in the course of pregnancy. Um, a little bit about pain management already with buprenorphine. I think it's something that um, we can certainly take some more questions about um, at the end if there are specific questions. It's just important to recognize that um, work with your teams in the delivery setting to limit the belief that maintenance doses of methadone or buprenorphine will be enough for analgesic and that um, there may be some higher medication requirements that might be expected. And then importantly, to um, avoid other high affinity partial ag agonists that can be used sometimes during labor management. Melone or Narcan should be prescribed to all women who are perinatal and receiving opioids because there is a significant escalation in risk for overdose death in the postpartum period, especially which is more so seen in women with who have a history of opioid use disorder and are not on agonist treatment, but it's also seen in women who have been in treatment during pregnancy because treatment transitions can occur in the postpartum period. And so this rate of overdose really escalates in especially the six to 12 months postpartum. And so overdose prevention should be discussed at all times. I um, mentioned before, naltrexone is emerging as another um, treatment for opioid use disorder. There's limited human data, but it may be something that's reasonable, to, especially to continue if somebody is already stable on it. Um, thing about choosing, it's really about um, when if someone's already stable on treatment, like as I just mentioned with naltrexone, even methadone or buprenorphine, it's really best not to switch in the course of pregnancy. And then the remainder is really trying to assess patient preference, access to care, how structured of a treatment does somebody need, um, and especially um, to caution women who may desire to switch from methadone to buprenorphine to really um, to permit the, um, the desire to switch from methadone to buprenorphine because of the long half-life and some of the, the pharmacologic characteristics that get really difficult. So it's, I'm going to transition a little bit to talking about some of the implications for opioid use in the neonate because um, neonatal opioid withdrawal is really one of the reasons that um, this crisis has especially been focused on the perinatal patient because we've got really um, increasing prevalence of this diagnosis in our special care nurseries and NICUs around the state. Um, just a word about the change in nomenclature. We talked about NAS, neonatal abstinence syndrome, for many years. But we're trying to shift the nomenclature to neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. It's more descriptive, it's more specific, and it helps distinguish from the neonatal adaptation syndrome that we see with um, uh, maternal SSRI use um, and the neonate in the early postpartum period, which has very different um, approach to treatment. Rates of neonatal opioid withdrawal have increased nationally along, alongside the rates of escalated opioid use. This is partially, these numbers do include women who are on prescribed opioids um, for the pain, also for the treatment of opioid use disorder. So some of this increase may in fact be women in treatment. So it's not that we're saying that this increase is entirely made up of, of certain behavior, but it's important to know that um, the rates continue to increase in parallel to this good epidemic that we're seeing across the country. Um, in the context of a neonatal opioid withdrawal or neonatal abstinence syndrome, it's important to know that breastfeeding for newborns is um, uh, it be encouraged and, in fact, um, is the, uh, an important pharmacologic treatment for neonatal opioid withdrawal symptoms and that ad lib breastfeeding and maternal rooming in is part of an effort called Eat Sleep Console that has an immense amount of data demonstrating decreased um, hospital stay, increased maternal infant bonding, and um, significant decrease in development of neonatal opioid withdrawal symptoms. Uh, move along to talk a bit about alcohol use in pregnancy in the perinatal patient. Um, this thing that I think has, is much more um, well understood or, or kind of well accepted in, in the general population that alcohol use during pregnancy is associated with heavy alcohol use is associated with neurodevelopmental consequences, um, infantile obstetric consequences. The definition of heavy use and what is 
a, a small enough amount to say that it's okay is very difficult to define. And so most professional bodies at this point are towards recommending use at all during pregnancy because of significant um, risks both um, obstetrically as well as um, developmentally. Um, and this pair is really just a reminder that we all uh, learn about one particular neurodevelopmental consequence, which is in the, the category of neurobehavioral disorders associated with alcohol exposure, um, previously called fetal alcohol um, spectrum disorders. But there are other um, risks, including um, pregnancy risk, like risk for miscarriage or spontaneous abortion, preterm labor. Um, there's a risk for learning disorders of other sorts and executive dysfunction, increased risk for sudden infant death syndrome, so as well as neonatal intoxication and withdrawal that can happen from prenatal alcohol exposure. Conditions can impact alcohol use, so it's really important to think about as a provider that really having a conversation that includes screening and assessing, as we discussed earlier, and then providing clear recommendations to abstain in and of itself is a brief intervention. Bringing education about potential harms in the evidence shows that simply having a conversation that with a brief amount of education can impact behavior. So you can build on that by setting goals and evaluating strategies and triggers. And so a brief interve intervention, it's less demonstrated efficacy is with alcohol use, but this can really be carried forward to all substances of abuse, really. Uh, lactation and the postpartum period alcohol use can impact lactation, so it can decrease breast milk volume and the milk production, and then also really results in a high exposure risk. Alcohol equilibrates across membranes within 30 to 60 minutes, so um, ongoing use during lactation can result in significant exposure for a baby who's uh, breastfeeding, um, and so it's important to counsel about this. It's a tough topic because of the sort of complexity of the legal and, um, and recreational environment. Um, it's the most commonly used illicit substance in pregnancy, and whether it's illicit is a little bit regional. So its current recreational use in Massachusetts is legal. Um, but we still, in, for the purposes of research, are still considering it in this illicit category. Um, Eight to 60 percent of users of cannabis will continue to use during pregnancy. Um, so it's an important thing to be talking with women about. Um, it's also important to know that the the level of um, THC or the active sort of intoxicant in, in marijuana is 25, it's 25 times greater than the marijuana of the 70s, where much of the research about that that's cited about um, medical benefits and, and physical um, quote unquote safety is derived it's from older studies with a really different product than what, what's present now. There's a lot of theoretical risk about potential risk for developmental um, impact. Um, some emerging uh, literature on um, impact on visual processing and specific and cognition. Um, it's also been associated with intrauterine growth restriction and lower birth weight and head circumference and really has an impact on lactation. It may, in fact, inhibit milk supply and of all the um, substances of, just of use, misuse and uh, substance uses of, uh, of abuse um, and medication. It's the one, only one that I uh, talk about that actually concentrates in breast milk, and so with chronic use, the the, the level in breast milk um, as compared to maternal serum level is can be as as high as eight times the maternal serum level. So the potential for exposure postpartum is really quite high. Cocaine and is the last substance. I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about just to give a um, a quick um, just about it. The risks of cocaine, it's, we're really shifting from this like old 1980s, 1990s discussion of this question of a crack baby. The reality is that cocaine use itself is not as clearly associated with um, developmental effects. There have been some uh, small effect sizes seen with an increased risk for ADHD um, or potential for language development or executive functioning. These are not the, there's a clear withdrawal syndrome for the no name or the, uh, the adult woman either. Most of the risks associated with um, ongoing use during pregnancy are related to vasoconstriction and therefore placental functioning. Um, it's also really important to know that the one important risk is that intoxication during um, late pregnancy or during labor can mimic preeclampsia with the hyperautonomia, the elevated vital signs, high, uh, high blood pressure, 
fever, um, headache potentially, as well as um, elevated heart rate. And so it's important to think about and wonder about, especially in someone who may be at risk for use, um, that this be an issue with cocaine. Still, on the other hand, it's a little more complex because stimulants can be used therapeutically for um, a variety of indications, most importantly ADHD, but also adjunctive treatment for depression or other things. Um, and so therapeutic use really needs to be distinguished from abuse. Um, the, the risks associated with stimulant misuse is, are really parallel those of cocaine. And in fact, much of the data about cocaine included um, women with uh, uh, pattern use of amphetamines, um, where therapeutic use is really not associated with many risks, maybe small elevated risk for mis poor maternal weight gain or um, smaller for gestational age babies. So really all of this is just a way to describe that McPath for Moms is here to help and it, our aim is to promote maternal and child health by building the capacity of fine providers to address maternal mental health and really to broaden that view of mental health to include substance use needs. And so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, well, to one, I want to acknowledge all of our team um, of psychiatrists, the leadership team, including myself and, and Dr. Byatt, who you heard from earlier, as well as our, all of our other consulting psychiatrists um, at our three hubs at Brigham and Women's Hospital, UMass Memorial, and at Bay State out in Springfield. Um, and then also to just um, encourage all of you to call our line at any time, visit our website, and, um, and thank you so much for your attention. Um, now we have time left for questions, and I'm happy to to take some for um, that great uh, presentation. So if if people have questions, please um, use the question function to ask questions, or you can click the hand button, and we will we can mute your line and call to allow you to ask questions or make a comment. I have a question, Lena. Can you? I'd like to hear a little bit more. I know you talked about, you know, the difference between Subutex, you know, single and combination, um, you know, Subutex versus Suboxone. And could you describe a little bit? I'd like to hear a little bit more about the difference between Suboxone and Subutex, kind of in general, and then also as it relates to, you know, pregnant women. I, I heard talking about the the issue with access. I'm curious to hear sort of if you take away the issue of access, what the risks, like what would be the benefits of each, what sure, Subutex sure. kind of historically preferred and so forth. So the reason Subutex, the single formulation was historically preferred is that because the combination formulation carries naloxone. Um, and in animal studies, naloxone in, in gigantic way super therapeutic doses as compared to what would be used, um, and yet it, certainly what would be all consumed, even if um, the buprenorphine were abused, um, would cause in animal studies uh, some structural teratogenicity. So both from the view that any potential risk for exposure, additional exposure, plus this, this kind of animal data um, suggests that the most um, kind of conservative view would be to just go with a single formulation. Um, However, since that time, since that practice is established, the reduction of the single formulation has decreased significantly. And so the access issues really are the main distinguishing factor. Because the combination formulation, it, both are taken in the same way. They're both sublingual. They're both um, taken by the same frequency. The pharmacology is entirely the same. The combination formulation only exists at a, com a combination with naloxone because this is the only way it could be approved in the U.S. by the FDA. In Europe, it's actually much more common to have just single formulation. Um, but FDA viewed that having the naloxone, which would really be a deterrent um, to crushing and injecting the suboxone, um, would be there to, to deter from mis. So in reality, in either medication, the experience, the pharmacology, the physiology is all the same between the formulations. Sounds like what determines the patient working with a patient, their choice, what their what the patient would access, what the patient would be recommended is really what they have access to. If they have access to, sounds like if they have access to Suboxone, that would be good. That would be fine. If they have access to Subutex, that would be fine too. Does that make sense? Right. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do other people have questions? Uh, 
saw another one pop up by chat, but I don't know how to see it either. Can you see that? The, Anyone? Yes, the question is, um, can you talk more about breastfeeding recommendations in patients on methadone or Suboxone uh, in the withdrawal period of baby, um, but going forward? Absolutely. So. Um, the really exciting data that's coming out of this kind of movement towards rumen and maternal infant funding has kind of solidified this belief that breastfeeding can be incredibly helpful for the neonate um, in uh, increasing the incidence of neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. But it's important to think about is breastfeeding um, indicated or safe? With met both methadone and buprenorphine, the amount of either medication that's present in breast milk is incredibly low. The relative infant dose for methadone is at like 2 to 5 percent of the maternal serum uh, level, or maternal dose rather, and um, for buprenorphine is a little bit higher, but if you remember, buprenorphine itself is not orally bioavailable. It requires sublingual dosing, and most neonates are not holding the breast milk that they're taking on their tongue for 15 to 30 minutes without swallowing. And so the exposure is actually even less than, um, than because it's not orally bioavailable at all. So the levels for both um, these medications is incredibly low, um, undetectable in infants exposed through lactation. And so the recommendation regarding breastfeeding can, is really, um, there's not a, a lot of agreed upon um, Parameters for this, but different institutions will have different um, different standards. And so, some institutions require that a woman be um, her urinary her urine tox toxicologic testing be negative, and the baby's meconium be negative before um, the woman is allowed to breastfeed. Some will say simply at the time of delivery, a negative toxicologic screen for that woman is enough to allow her to breastfeed. Feed because the, risk, the concern is the risk for exposure to potential other substances or substances of use rather than just the um, the, IT, the medication um, for addiction. And so whether to breastfeed can be a complex decision depending on the institutional standards and the stability of that patient. But if a woman is on medication assisted treatment and is stable and the proof is that she's sober, um, then it's really very reasonable to breastfeed with using either of the um, medications um, that are first line. Thank you for the great question. We, uh, and questions? I think we have time for maybe, we have time for probably one more question if anyone has it. And if you see a question coming up, please tell me because for some reason on my screen I can't see hands. <laughs> I don't know why they're not showing up. I'm just curious about, so you talked about a bit about cocaine use in pregnancy. What would be the general treatment options for that? So if you're working with someone who, who you know, does come in reporting, you know, or, or you, you know, suspect, detect uh, cane use, what are the general treatment recommendations there? That great question was not a very exciting answer. The reality is that treatment for isolated cocaine use disorder is really, really difficult. Um, a lot of the resources that exist for um, treatment uh, are focused on medications and substances that have withdrawal syndromes or medication management. And cocaine is not managed, the cocaine use disorder is not really well, there's not great data for use of any particular medications to decrease cravings or use. Treatments are primarily psychosocial, meaning therapy, counseling, group work, um, therapeutic communities. A lot of it's very difficult to access for isolated cocaine use disorder, and in fact, also for cannabis use disorder as well. Um, and so, really, it's mostly the psychosocial, really trying to to be able to access, uh, you know, counseling and therapy um, or group settings. Mm -hmm. Well, peer recovery type settings. Peer relationship settings. Okay, that's very helpful. Okay, good. Well, thank you, and um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we hope it was helpful. And, and any further questions could be emailed to mcpap at beaconhealthoptions.com. And also a reminder that you will be receiving a survey 
Um, please complete that, and the recording will be available on the website. And also, please feel free to call our program. As you can hear, we have you know we can certainly provide expertise around perinatal substance use disorders, and we're very happy to take calls regarding that and any other any other questions you have regarding patients you're working with. Okay, thank you much. Thank you.